Good morning, everybody. How you doing today? Uh, I'm Pastor Chris. Um, I am preaching for Jason again this week, and uh, I've been going through a, a really mini series here on Lazarus. I calling it Raising Lazarus, and uh, it's all about Jesus raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. And I want to start by giving us a recap as to where we were uh, left off last week, and so I'm going to go through it, all right? Um, what we first know is that Lazarus was sick, right? And he was a friend, and he was a follower of Jesus, and his sisters were so concerned about Lazarus that they called for, for Jesus to come and heal their brother. And Jesus wasn't in a rush. Everybody would think that he would be in a rush, that he would come and he would, he would go and heal his friend Lazarus, but he waited, right? He waited for two days, and, and he said that this will not end in death. This will not end in death. Actually, it'll be used for the glory of God. And so he waited. And Mary and Martha did not like this, right? Everybody was kind of wondering what was going on, right? But Jesus just waited, right? And what we found in that is that Jesus is not a lawnmower parent. I talked about lawnmower parents last week. And lawnmower parents are ones that knock down every obstacle, knock down anything that could possibly give your children pain before they even get there. I wonder if you even were thinking like, oh, am I doing that this week? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I'm always thinking about that because we often do it, right? It's, it's, it's very easy to fall into that lawnmower pattern. Who wants their kids to be in pain, right? And what we found is that God is not a lawnmower God, that he allows us because of the freedoms that we live in this world, God allows us to go through hardship and pain. We would really like him to be a lawnmower God, but he allows us to go through hardship and pain. But then we saw that Jesus came to Mary and Martha, and uh, they were so mad, they, they let him have it. They, they yelled at him, and, and he said, let me see where Lazarus is. And uh, he goes to the tomb with them, and he cries alongside them. And what that tells us is that, yes, he may allow us to have hurts and pains, but he is with us in our hurts and pains. He feels them like we do. He cries with us, and he is with us when we are hurt, hurting, when we're in pain, and he is with us, and we are not alone. And I left everybody with one of those crazy cliffhangers, okay? Um, you know, we didn't get to the resurrection yet. I kind of let you sit in the, in, in the darkness, and, and, and he was just there crying, and that's where I left it off. And so hopefully we weren't sad all week, all right? But, um, and, 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 you know, I, I didn't do it like our shows sometimes do, and like, all right, new episodes are in two years. Um, very often you're like, okay, so what's happening? And, new, and to be honest, you can always pick up your Bible and just read further. Uh, it's there, right? But um, today we're going to go from the pain of waiting of sitting in expectation saying, what's happening? I don't know how this is going to turn out. Sitting in that darkness, right, to resurrection, life and resurrection. We're going to go from doubt and misunderstanding to life and belief and faith. We're going to go from darkness to light. Jesus, we will see, is the place of transformation. And so that's where we're going today. So let's uh, move to our scripture. This is John chapter 11, and we're going to start out in verse 38. Jesus, once more mo deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of, of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. For he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? You know, everyone who works in ministry, whether, whether volunteering or, or part-time or full-time, 
uh, especially if they're teaching and doing different things, they all have a specific area of ministry that they really feel called to. It's like their people, right? Their, their specific context. In ministry, we often call it a context, right? Like everybody has a specific context that they like to work with, right? There are men in our church that love to do like men's Bible studies and work with men and, 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 and do life and, 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 and hardships with the men in this church. And it's just awesome. That's their context, right? Um, there are amazing men and, and, and women who, who, um, who serve the children in the church, and they can speak like this special language to kids at their level that the kids can understand, and the kids feel very comforted by them. And it's just amazing in how they can teach these kids. And some people who are, who, who are not kid people are like, how do they do it, right? And so everybody says, Pastor Teresa has a special Bible study in the middle of the week, right, during the day. And I swear, when I walk by, it's like standing room only in the Connect Center. There's so many people in this room. Uh, she does some amazing things there. Um, Heather and our volunteers handle little babies in the nursery, and that is definitely not me, and I'm da- out of that phase of life, and you do, yeah, that's amazing people that can, that can comfort these children and, and help them to feel safe uh, while their parents worship, and it is just awesome. And now there's a specific group of people that help out in a certain place in this church that I believe that most people don't jump for joy for. Um, and uh, in a specific area where these leaders kind of have some screws loose in their brain in order to be working in this context. And a lot of people are like, no, no, no. Like, um, specifically, they'll say, I will serve anywhere except for in that small place. I will not work with those people. And that, my friends is with the junior high boys. <laughs> All right? Um, now, if you want to meet some of these amazing, godly people that work with the, this grouping of people, you have to ask Jen and Lindsay, because uh, you want to meet some awesome, awesome people, they, that's where you're going to find them. Now, when I work with the junior hires, uh, and, and I always tell them that most people don't jump for joy to serve and, and work with them. And there are people that do. It's, you're amazing, crazy people, right? And, and when I tell them this, this is how you know that the junior high boys just are different. They come from a different breed. They're just different, and they're just different animals, is that when I tell them that they're hard to work with, they all stand up, cheer, and give each other high fives. <laughs> That's how you know that they are just out there, right? And uh, they consider that like a badge of honor. That's what they do, right? They're like, yes, yes, we are difficult, yes. Um, and I know all this because I've been a junior high uh, youth pastor before, and, and if you've ever gone on, on a retreat or, um, or, or um, like a, a mission trip with junior hires, uh, you will know full well that there's one other thing that they are specifically proud of, just like uh, being hard and things like that, they are specifically very, very proud of the smells that come off of their bodies, all right? And so, um, and what I will say that as as I was doing junior high youth ministry for for over 20 years, and uh, a staple for junior hires is this right here. Uh, It's called Axe Body Spray, all right? They just spray it everywhere, um, and I know all of these things because I was once a junior high boy as well. And, and, and we're, they're just awesome, right? And so there's actually, there used to be, I don't think it's on there anymore, but there used to be a warning label on Axe Body Spray that said, that said um, may lead to close encounters with the opposite sex. Um, and so, but that, that's not on there anymore. But so nothing screams junior hires more than Axe Body Spray. So if you had a junior hire in your house at one time, you will know this stuff, right? See, when it comes to Jesus, the smell of death did not keep him away. It didn't, right? They were saying, Jesus, he's been in the tomb. Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. The odor is 
is just going to be really bad. And it, it didn't keep him out. It did not keep him out. Um, you see, death cannot stop Jesus. Even the smell of death will not stop Jesus. You know, when, when it comes to, to uh, looking at people whom Jesus could transform and change, a lot of times people have it in their minds that some people, some people have a certain smell to them that they're just too far gone. That uh, Jesus can transform people, but he can't transform those people. And sometimes we even think about that about ourselves. So yeah, that Jesus can probably transform all of these other people, but he could not transform me. He doesn't know what I got going on in here. I mean, I hear it all the time. Like when we have funerals and people that who, who, who are not normally come into a church, like a wedding or things like that, and um, people often say, well, I can't believe that, that, uh, the, that the walls haven't fallen down. I'm in here. Um, and I always say, if, if they let me be a pastor in this church, then surely you could be uh, be in this church, and then they're usually thinking for a while after they, I say that, but we often think of ourselves in, in a similar way to that. You know, a lot of times we think that the odor of us and our brokenness is something that Jesus won't even come near, and that's not true, that death cannot stop Jesus. Six years ago, I, I started a journey, and it was a, just a different journey. I wanted to do something uh, on top of what I already did in ministry. I had been doing, uh, I was a pastor at about eight years at that point, right? And uh, I wanted to do something on top of what I already was doing in ministry. A lot of people go for their doctorates. I was like, I want to try something else that I could really reach out to people. And so I decided to get my... Um, my master's in marriage and family counseling, which I, I've talked about before, and uh, I never realized how much that would affect my ministry and everything that I do. Uh, it, it affected the way I look at people. It, it, it changed everything that I do now. It, everything ended up being different. You see, I have sat with some people uh, in my time in doing counseling that have done some pretty harsh stuff in their life. Uh, some people that have some really skewed ways of looking into, into the world. Um, some people that are stuck in addictions that they can't get out of. And what I've learned through working with all of those different people is that I was always asking the wrong question. I was always asking the wrong question when I was working with people uh, who had things going on in their life. And I approached it in the wrong way. But the question that I now ask is, what happened to this person that made, makes them think this way or, or act this way? What happened to this person that makes them think this way or act this way? See, if you sit with someone long enough, you can find the pain. If you sit and hear someone long enough, they'll tell you of the trauma that they went through. Everyone was once a child who went through something. Everyone was once a child who had to grow up too fast. And, and maybe they had to become and act like an adult at way too young of an age. And, and they uh, formed some skills during that time that now as an adult, they don't need those skills anymore. Everyone was once a child that just needed a safe environment. So now I always ask that question, what happened to this person or what did they go through that makes them act or think this way? Everyone was once a child that was in, put in an unfair place. You know, when it comes to Jesus, he is the one who is willing to walk up to the odor of the death that surrounds our lives. Remember we said that he's not a lawnmower God? He's not going to mow over and make sure you don't go through all of those, but he's there with you during all of them. But he's the one that's willing to go up to the death of our lives, right? The places where nobody else will go to. And why does he do this? Because he knows 
the story. He knows. He sees all the, the things that, as a child, we needed leading. And when he looks at us, he sees us as that child, even though that we're adults now. Nobody else sees it, but Jesus sees that. And so he's willing to go and roll away the stone in the tomb and un unleash all of the death that's inside of us, the odors of all of it. And he's willing to go to that place because he sees you as that child that once had no choice. Jesus is not afraid of death, not even the death of our lives. And he's the only one who can answer what happened to this person. So let's move to our next place. Uh, verse 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This past fall, uh, we had the craziest week. Uh, as you know, a lot of you know, we, we moved and, and transferred our whole lives out uh, to New Jersey which is a very interesting place. Uh, I grew up here, but my rest of my family did not. And um, we transitioned our lives here, right? And, uh, you know, transitioning your lives with children and moving has a lot of ups and downs, right? The kids had to go to new schools, make new friends. Uh, we had to, you know, transition our whole lives and find out new ways to living. And, and let's be honest, it was stressful at times. It was just a new year and a new, uh, you know, way of life, all of it. Now, my daughter absolutely loves her cats, okay? It's her thing, right? Uh, we have uh, Coco, who when we moved here on the trip to New Jersey, uh, he got a New Jersey name, and so we no longer call him Coco. His name is Bob now, so he's got a New Jersey name. His name is Bob, so um, Oscar stayed Oscar. Oscar's over there, okay? My daughter is the cat whisperer. She speaks and the cats come running from out uh, wherever they are in the house to her. They sleep with her. Um, they just follow her. They obviously, they, they're okay with being dressed up by her, like all of it. She is 11. Uh, she loves her cat. She even has a backpack that she walks around the neighborhood with the cats inside and... Uh, it's just, it's just awesome. And to, to see the love of her and her cats, and she's always been like that. Ever since day one, she's always loved the cats. Um, this fall, we had the craziest, most stressful week. Uh, one of our cats, Oscar, all the way to the right, he got out of the house. Uh, we didn't know he was gone for a day. Uh, our cats are, are inside cats. They don't ever go outside. And he got out. And... Um, and then we're in the new neighborhood. We're like, you know, how is he going to know? What, you know? And he got out, and he was gone for many days. Um, and and it, was, it was actually heartbreaking to see. My daughter is an absolute introvert. So since she's 11, this is probably the last possible uh, illustration I can use in a sermon of her. Um, so uh, I got her permission. Um, but... Um, she is a, she's an extreme introvert, and she even she went knocking on people's doors asking them if they saw her cat. It is an absolute heartbreaking thing as a parent. We put flyers out. We put social media posts out. And, you know, like I talk about lawnmower parents, like this one I wanted to mow over. Like I did not want my child to go through this, especially since we just moved. And we're in this tough year of transitions and all these things. I was determined, I am going to find this cat. Like, there is nothing that is going to stop me from finding this cat. Um, and she will know if I found a cat that looks like it and tried to sneak it in. It would never work, right? Um, 
And so what I did was I, I, you know, cats are nocturnal, so they only come out at night. And so what I did is I I went out at 10 o'clock at night with a flashlight. I went out at 12 o'clock, midnight, flashlight, 2 a.m., flashlight, 4 a.m., flashlight. I was scurrying through people's yards. I was thinking during this time, what is the news article going to say? Like, pastor sneaks into yard. 4 a.m. with flashlight in bushes. Like, I was thinking about all of these things, and I didn't care. I was going to find this cat. Uh, The cat, every time we saw it, the cat would run away. And so it was just, like, heartbreaking. Um, And so uh, what I did was I set up four traps around the neighborhood in people's bushes. I didn't ask for permission. Sorry. Um, Just set it in there, right? And what I found is that we just kept getting neighborhood cats. We caught 11 cats. My daughter named all of them. So now we have a name for every wandering cat in the neighborhood. And so I had to go and like let these cats out every night. And so like, but like, it was crazy, right? But finally, it was so awesome to see the neighborhood was like pulling together. It was an awesome way of God using this, right? To help us feel comforted by the neighborhood. Everybody in the neighborhood was like reaching out and, 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 and like connecting with us and was like, I saw your cat. And I was like, it was like a, you know, like a brown cat. And like, this looks nothing like the picture. Um, but, um, but it was like, thank you, thank you, you know. Um, but one day, one lady was like, your cat is running towards your house. And we're like, no, he's not. Like, it's just another one. Like, we would get so many. It was awesome. But we walked outside and sure enough, it was our cat running towards us and towards our house. And we went out there, and as soon as it heard us, like always, just ran away. And at that time, my wife and my daughter start yelling out to the cat, like, come, Oscar, come back, come back. And it was running, and Oscar was running away. But at some point, it's like he recognized their voice. And he just went and turned and started crying and just ran and jumped in their arms. It was like at some point he just recognized their voice. It was the craziest, craziest thing. And we're all crying because, one, I hadn't had any sleep in like seven days. And, um, and so it, it was a very emotional moment. I mean, people were celebrating in our streets and we felt connected, like, right? Jesus calls out Lazarus from the tomb. He doesn't physically go in there and pull him out. He says, Lazarus, come out. It's as if Lazarus knew his voice, right? It's like Lazarus knew his voice. Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped. I love how they called him the dead man still, right? He's walking. And they're like, the dead man. Like saying, like, it wasn't, he wasn't alive waiting in there. He was a dead man. He was dead for four days. He stunk and everything. The dead man knew the voice and came out. They want you to know fully that Lazarus was dead. And so they kept calling him the dead man. As I said before, Jesus knows our stories. He knows our stories. He knows our pains. He knows the things that we've experienced. And I truly believe that embedded in us, when we're born, is an ability to know that voice. That that voice, through all the, per- the pains, all the things that you go through, right? The voice was always calling out, but we just didn't notice it, just like Oscar. He didn't notice it yet. And so the, the voice keeps calling and keep calling. And at some point, if we calm our lives down, if we calm our souls down enough, we can hear that voice, the voice that's been calling to us since we were a child. Today, I invite you to quiet your heart, to listen to that calling. Is Jesus calling you out to come and follow him? Maybe you've been hearing it and you just didn't recognize the voice through the pain, through all of it. I can guarantee you and promise you, as we know in this story, 
that when you were going through it, he was there. He was weeping by your side, and you just might not have heard that voice yet. Maybe you've been too scared. Uh, maybe you feel like you're, you're just too far gone, that your stink is something that Jesus wouldn't go near. The truth is, Jesus knows what happened in your life. He knows what you've been through. As a child or as an adult, and he's not seeing you as someone that's too far gone. He's never has. But that child in need of a loving, safe parent to guide you in the right place. You see, he still sees you as that child. He still sees you. So I ask you today to listen to that voice that's calling out. Come out. Come out. I'm calling you. Listen and follow the voice. The voice that will bring you from a journey that leads to death to a journey that leads to life. Come out. Come on out. The best part of this story is that Lazarus comes out and he still has grave clothes on. See, when, when you, when, back then when you, when you die, they prepare your body for death and they put grave clothes on your body, right? And so he comes out and he's still got the grave clothes on, right? And, and I believe that many people, like when they, they think of following Jesus, right? And you, you follow Jesus and you become a believer that as soon as you become the believer and you, or you get baptized or, or whatever it is and you say, I'm going to follow Jesus, that all of a sudden your whole life and all your decisions and everything just changes right away. And the reality is that's not always the case. That sometimes the changing of your life happens slowly. Like, a lot of times we think that we're just all immediately supposed to make all the right choices, right? And that's just not usually how it happens, right? That, that, that when people look at us in this building, they say, well, they're all the real Christians that have it all together. And let's be honest, we don't have it all together. We're, we're broken like anybody else. And what it is that are many of us are still walking with grave clothes on, that the journey of being a Christian is that the whole journey is learning to take the grave clothes off off. That we, we literally get risen from the dead, right? And, and Jesus wakes us and he says, take the grave clothes off. And it's a whole journey of living life, learning how to take the grave clothes off. Once we follow that voice, our job is to learn how to take the grave clothes off so that we can live in a life that's not weighed down by the death. We learn how to shed our addictions. We learn how to put boundaries around people that keep bringing us into places that we do not want to go. You see, we learn how to read God's word and, and pray and find peace in our very, very stressful lives, right? And we learn how to treat others the way that Jesus calls us to treat others. And all of this is a process of taking the grave clothes off like Jesus called Lazarus to do. You know, in, in the Bible, the, the, the Christians were nicknamed the way because their whole life was dedicated to following in the way of Jesus, a way of just taking those grave clothes off. Church is not a place for perfect people. And I will tell you, I am not a perfect pastor and broken like anybody else. Church is a place where we learn to take the grave clothes off. We find that the rest of our lives is dedicated to following Jesus and learning how to do that. 